This is the second episode of a three-part series on integral philosopher Ken Wilber's work exploring the nature of spiritual development. In the first episode, we looked at the possibility of framing the difference between those experiencing higher spiritual states and us regular folks as being comparable to the difference between a blind person and a sighted person. In this thought experiment, we played with the possibility that what the spiritual and religious mystics are trying to communicate is an experience that is as impossible to put into words as green is to a blind person. Seen from this perspective then, the spiritual sages are experiencing something that the rest of us aren't, and the holy texts are impotent attempts to make a blind person see green. In this episode, we're going to be taking a different angle on the same problem, and we're going to look at Wilbur's contention that higher spiritual states are post-Piagetian stages of development. In preparation for this exploration, we looked at what Piaget's theory of development is and what the four stages are in the last episode, so if you're curious to learn more about Piaget's theory, I'll put a link to that episode in the cards and in the description below. But the basic idea is that Piaget's four levels chart the development of the individual from birth up to adolescence. This work of Piaget has been built on by so-called post-Piagetian researchers who look for stages of development beyond these four levels of Piaget. And this is where Ken Wilber slots in. He takes the work of these theorists to a new level by exploring the idea that higher spiritual states are in fact post-formal Piagetian stages of development. And what we mean by post-formal here is coming after Piaget's fourth developmental stage, which is called formal operation. In this episode, we're going to look at Wilbur's argument for this, and what it means to say that spiritual experiences are post-Piagetian stages of development. In one of his legendary experiments, Piaget took a group of kids at the pre-operational stage, so they'd all be between the ages of three and seven, and he sat each child down. He had a jug of water and two glasses, one tall and thin, the other short and fat. The experiment is simple. You fill up your short, fat glass and you pour the water from that into the tall, thin glass. Then you ask the child which glass has more water, the tall, thin one or the short, fat one. The pre-op child will tell you that the tall glass has more water. You can pour the water back and forth as many times as you want, but the child will still think the tall glass has more. They're unable to see that the quantity hasn't been changed just because its form has. This is a logical ability called conservation that doesn't develop until the child enters the concrete operational phase. In another experiment, you take a line of checkers and form them into two lines, and you ask the pre-op child which line has more, and they'll tell you they're the same. But now, if you widen out the checkers in one line and you ask the child again, they'll say there's more in the widened line. This is again because they haven't developed the cognitive faculty of conservation. And because they are missing these simple logical understandings, these so-called concrete operations like conservation, the child's entire map of the world is warped. It's not a matter of the world being different, it's quite literally that they cannot comprehend the structure of reality. What we see then is that you can be swimming in a world of truths that you are simply incapable of understanding once you have understood them, they become the most obvious thing in the world. There's an interesting caveat to the water glass conservation task. If you video it and show it to the child when they've moved on to the next developmental stage called concrete operational, they will think that you have doctored the video. They can't even imagine that anyone could not understand that the amount of water in each glass is the same. And since they can't remember, the most logical explanation is that the video has been doctored. That is the level of change we are talking about with cognitive development. The thing is that the child at pre-operational understands language. They know the words and they know the grammar. And so you can explain to them that the water is the same in both glasses. You can tell them that there's a limitation to their understanding. They might even nod along as if they've understood. But you repeat the experiment and they can't be convinced otherwise. Wilbur's argument is that the same thing is happening with spiritual experiences. When the mystic says that all is one, or talks to you about nirvana, or about Tao, or about emptiness, or about the dark night of the soul, you can understand the words, and you can even think you understand their meaning. But, and this is Wilbur's point, you are missing the cognitive development that would allow you to make sense of that experience. Like the Kanap child, you are swimming in a world abounding in post-concrete operational truths. 
but because of the limitations of your cognitive stage, you can't understand them. It's the most obvious thing in the world to the Buddha or to Lao Tzu or to Plotinus that reality is non-dual, that there's no division, that everything is one. And yet, despite the obviousness of this truth to them, we have no way of seeing it any more than the pre-op child can see that there's the same amount of water in each glass. At best, we can be shrewd and we can be clever. Just some candy involved in getting the right answer, then perhaps the child might tell you that the water is the same in both glasses. When there's status up for grabs in the spiritual community, then you have an incentive to parrot the correct words. But that doesn't mean you've understood them. This is Wilbur's point with the Piagetian stages. It's a more refined example than the comparison with the blind man, because there's no physical sense that changes between the child at pre-op and the child at can-op. It is simply a matter of an increased cognitive complexity radically altering the perspective on the world. The sensory experience of the can-op child and the pre-op child is the same. They're receiving the same sensory data, but the processing power of one of them is simply qualitatively different to the other. The same goes for the difference between the spiritual sages and us regular folk. Those who are operating at higher spiritual stages are somehow leaning in to a higher level of cognitive development. They're not gaining new senses, but there's a new layer of complexity to their minds that enables them to see the world in a different way. I find this argument fascinating, because what Wilbur is doing is he's taking the findings of modern scientific developmental psychology and he's combining it with the spiritual developmental systems. These spiritual developmental systems are maps of the higher potentials of development in the individual. A few months back in the channel, we did an exploration of Jung's reading of the chakra system as being a map of the stages of higher development. Wilbur takes these religious slash spiritual ladders of development and tapes them onto the Piagetian stages to create a comprehensive map of human development. Here's where we've come from and here's where we're going. It's a fascinating conception and it seems to tell us not just where we've evolved to so far, but also what the future of human evolution is. It promises a future for humanity that is increasingly spiritual and increasingly conscious. But alas, it seems to be built on sand. Unlike Piaget, Wilbur is a theorist, and what is missing are any experiments that show that this is the next level of development, that show that the trajectory of human development tends into the spiritual direction that he sees. The Piagetian route seems to be a dead end for this search, because when you look at the most advanced model of development that goes beyond Piaget's four levels, which would be Michael Commons' model of hierarchical complexity, or MHC, what you see are not the higher spiritual levels that Wilbur talks about. When you go from sensory motor to pre-op to con-op to form-op, and then onwards to post-formal stages, there isn't a sudden turn to spirituality. It doesn't go from reason to post-rationality as Wilbur theorises. The model of hierarchical complexity simplifies Piaget's system to some extent. It is an attempt to create a mathematically grounded and measurable map of complexity. And to do this, it focuses in on the individual's performance on tasks. The equivalent of the form-up stage is divided into two in the MHC. You have abstract and you have formal. At abstract, we develop the ability to form abstract thoughts and ideas. As Daniel Schmachtenberger has observed, it is this level of complexity that led to the cultural evolution of humanity. Because when you look at our primate cousins, you can see that many of them use tools. They can pick up a sharp stone and use it as a tool for a specific purpose. But without the abstract notion of sharpness, you can't compare the sharpness of one object to another. You can't think about making a super sharp object because you haven't isolated the abstract concept that makes the tool so useful, i.e. sharpness. That requires the ability to abstract to something that is separate to the physical world. It's an idea that helps us to understand the physical world, but is itself separate. We see this complexity develop in children coming into adolescence, so in the 11 to 14 range in the stage of the MHC called abstract. Then you come to formal, at which point we can identify relations between abstract variables and devise ways to test them. We are able to solve problems in algebra with one unknown and we are now able to use deductive logic and empiricism. This development takes place in the latter half of adolescence. This is where the map over with Piaget ends. From there, Commons' MHC proceeds further along this path of development in cognitive complexity. So the next stage is called systematic, which is the ability to understand the abstract relations of the formal stage as being part of a greater system. Following that, you have metasystematic, 
that looks at the relations between different systems. And then you move into paradigmatic and finally cross-paradigmatic. And with each of these levels, what you see is an ability to work with broader and broader maps of complexity. This isn't to say that someone at cross-paradigmatic, like for example Darwin or Newton, it's not to say that they're spiritual geniuses. It's about the complexity of their thinking. This is limited to the cognitive field. The person isn't some kind of universal genius. Newton, after all, died eating mercury trying to alchemically turn lead into gold. What the MHC stage tells you is the complexity of task this person can work with. What it doesn't tell us is that cognitive complexity moves in the direction of spiritual refinement. If we accept the Commons as more empirically grounded work is correct, then it seems that Wilbur's take on Piaget is at best another fine analogy. The argument that the difference between spiritual masters and ordinary folk is a matter of cognitive development is a fascinating hypothesis. It seems a more accurate analogy to say that there is a cognitive development separating the spiritual sage from your average man or woman, but the evidence is less than compelling. At the very least, it seems more accurate than the blindness slash sighted analogy, since it is not a matter of hardware, but a difference of software. In the next episode of the series, we're going to look at how Wilbur might find a way around this challenge by looking at his conception of a paradigm within which spiritual experiences might be studied, thus giving us more information. This will take us into an exploration of the work of Thomas Kuhn and his work on the distinction between normal science and revolutionary science, and his development of the idea of an exemplar or a paradigm, a term that has seeped from his work into mainstream culture. That's everything that we're going to cover on this episode of The Living Philosophy. If you've enjoyed it and you're new to the channel, you might like to subscribe and give us a thumbs up down below. And if you have any thoughts, insights or feedback, I'd love to hear from you down in the comments. Otherwise, I shall see you next time. Thank you for watching.